playing cards up here. Good morning, everyone. It's always a pleasure to come to a fine arts festival gathering. There may have been once a time when I might have been a little abashed about showing up at a fine arts festival proceedings, particularly when I was young. Raised in the country as I was and among farm people, arts was one of the last thing. There were the arts were there, but they weren't recognized as the arts. Arts was one of the last things that uh, you'd think about and be one of the last things they would even talk about. It was all hard work on the farm. And if you didn't go to school, the reason you went to school is for some sound reason, as, uh, such as either becoming a teacher, and if, if you were to listen to your mother, usually your mother wanted you to do this, to become a preacher. You were, uh, that this, in the old days, in my youth, um, the two people most respected in the community, aside from the banker, uh, was the preacher or the teacher. Um, they were the leaders of the community. And so every mother who was very fond of her son, uh, would uh, one of her aspirations was to have her son become, uh, if possible, a preacher, but if not that, well, at least a teacher. So he'd be some sort of a respected person. They didn't ask you to dream to become either a preacher or a teacher because this was a, an artistic thing to do. The, word, the question of the word, or the question of the artist was about the last thing they thought of. Even though it probably was in their mind, they didn't recognize it as such. Uh, I have a running argument in conversation at home at parties with a local editor uh, who recently uh, took out after a bill that's in the legislature the arts, I think it's the Arts Council Bill, uh, something to do with the arts in Minnesota. Uh, he, since he, he sells most of his papers to the farmers over there, he seems to think that farmers wouldn't be interested in having a, a million dollar arts bill passed. And uh, we, we uh, cross swords every now and then. He calls uh, anything to do with the arts a frosting on the cake. Uh, my own feeling is that uh, uh, far from being the frosting on the cake, uh, to be an artist or to have uh, art, to be arts inclined and to be interested in arts is the core of uh, of the cake. And if anything, it's the core of a meal. Uh, when a person is most alive, usually is when he's a boy, a child before he's crushed by demands from the family or demands from society that he survive, that he gets enough food to eat, that he picks off enough fruit from the trees or, or grain from the fields. And the grind and the harshness of uh, the industrial world, uh, it's difficult to maintain that childlike attitude towards life when we're all artists, even the morons, even people with IQs of 50 or 60 or 70, still have with them a little tiny uh, uh, artist bud. The word art and the word artist have taken on an odd connotation. And we almost seem to use the words with quotes around them. We shouldn't at all. But I think whether you're a Christian or not, the basic um, uh, spirit or the basic core of, uh, of a human being is uh, is the time when he, as a little child, was a a natural creator. He took a creative attitude towards things, and it isn't just uh, people who paint and people who write and uh, people who sculpt and people who compose who are artists. Uh, there are artists in every walk of life. I try to tell this editor there that um, when I drive to the countryside about every fifth farm or so, I'll see an artist at work on this farm. Not only in the way he keeps it neat and the way he plants his windbreak 
and where he positions the garden to catch the most sun and be out of the chance of frost and uh, uh, too much uh, wind. Um, but it goes beyond that. It's the little touches that he puts on the yard where he, uh, where he, uh, what paint he uses for the barns and the houses. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, some sharp contrasts, which are eyesores at first become uh, instead uh, real uh, uh, fine things to look at. As contrasts often are a good, uh, a good sign of an artist at work. He'll invent little shortcuts that, that uh, no one else has about how to uh, put uh, two pieces of land together and save time. He'll invent ways of getting hay a little more economically into the... Of course, he'll use the reason for economics, but he'll do it in a sort of a deft way. Even the way he walks across the yard will tell you that here's a man who really is an artist, the way he runs his life. So far from art being a frosting on a cake, it's the basic core. This fellow kept the creator in him alive. He didn't let it die. This editor occasionally writes wild editorials, and I tell him that this is uh, when he's showing his artistic flair. Of course, this makes him wild when I tell him this because it, uh, it destroys his... Uh, he thinks he's currying favor with the farmers when he takes out after this uh, art spill that we have. Um, I happen to uh, have been myself, though, like he. He's, uh, uh, he's, he's in a state in which I once was, where I felt apologetic about being an artist and about anyone being uh, have artistic inclinations. Uh, when I went to, uh, well, when I was a young boy in the first place, I read a lot, and of course I couldn't help reflect my reading. Uh, whenever the family would get together on family reunions or threshing rig picnics at the end of the threshing uh, season, or just uh, Sunday afternoons, occasionally I'd use a couple of words that came out of my books, and right away they'd say, now, wait a minute, young man, no swearing around here. Uh, I'm using some word they hadn't heard. It was said sort of with a smile, but there was always a glint in it. Don't you stick out now, you see. Don't show any originality, because this doesn't help you in life. And the truth is that the person who has some originality and directs it into a, a, what's the work in front of him, uh, what's going on there is that a creator is at work that should be kept alive. Then in high school, I didn't do too well in any of my courses except history, and that was because we had a very inspiring his, history teacher. He's usually a little late to come to class, but when he walked in the door, he almost always had a question and he'd fire it at uh, either the most ignorant or the, 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 the dullard in class. And of course, that would always raise a, a smile from everybody's face and wake everybody up. Or else he'd hit, it, hit somebody that had a pretty good mind and he'd get a response. The moment the door opened, he'd ask some, fire some question at us. And then five minutes, we'd take off. He taught ancient history so well that Today, every once in a while, when I'm walking down the road or I happen to read a book or something, uh, for a fleeting second, uh, uh, the curtains will part in my head, and I'll see Athens, smell Athens, smell the sandals, see the fleas flying around, the dogs, see the Parthenon gleaming, complete, not destroyed by the Persian, but complete. It'll only last a second or two, and then the curtains will shut again. But he taught it so vividly that I see it literally, None of my other teachers had this ability. This man was an artist, and the other teachers, they just performed their tasks. But even so, uh, it was not my English teacher who inspired me to write poetry, which I was doing then, little uh, jingles and so on. It was a history teacher who would move me and stir me up. And I, of course, I had to have an audience, so <clears throat> I was shy of girls. Instead of talking to them directly, I sent them notes in the form of poetry of course, these were all passed around. Everybody would laugh about that. Uh, Freddie Feikema, crazy poems. <laughs> and see, uh, but with this, you, you, you go on uh, being apologetic about being an artist. In college, by the time I... I wasn't really full grown. I left high school. I was uh, 15 going on 16, and uh, I really was sent to school too early. Um, 
I didn't have my full growth until I came to college, but by that time I was uh, sort of uncoordinated and uh, sometimes one foot or the other foot didn't work and uh, he'd gawk all across the campus. And so here's this kid who would now and then turn in a poem to the Chimes, which is a school paper, and there would be great howls of glee. And they'd read this with hilarity, and I'd hear this. It would burn a little bit, but I noticed, though, that every now and then they'd print them. So uh, it wasn't quite so ridiculous after all. Uh, what made me even more sh made me even more shy about being a um, a uh, someone who was interested in writing, because I always had in my head that I was going to write someday poetry, particularly. I didn't think too much of novels on those days. Was that uh, uh, the first uh, semester in English? I had a Miss Timmer, Miss Johanna Timmer. Uh, bless her wherever she is, uh, she flunked me. And uh, uh, here was a fellow that was aspiring to write, and he flunks uh, freshman English. Uh, I hadn't played basketball in high school. I was just too busy uh, walking back and forth to school and uh, working on dairy farms and so on, so I didn't take up athletics. But the coach there at Calvin College saw me walking across the campus one day, and with that height, he decided I had to be a basketball player. So they had a crash program, what they now call a crash program, to make a player out of me. And he almost fainted when he discovered that I had flunked English, as that took me off the freshman squad. Well, they had many faculty meetings over this. <laughs> <laughs> they, the, uh, Dean and the president and the basketball coach and Miss Timmer particularly met a lot. <laughs> so um, the end result was uh, after Miss Timmer prayed over this to herself, her conscience, that she would withhold my mark, be a conditional, uh, and I'd be allowed to play the rest of the year. You see, that's um, we had a semester arrangement there, so we played into March. But uh, uh, and she'd give me the mark at the end of the year, provided I did very well in the second half. I didn't know really what was going on, why I did flunk, because I, uh, uh, I had some hint in high school. The reason I got passing grades in English in high school was that I did so well in Shakespeare, interpreting Shakespeare. When it came to the grammar side and the essay side, uh, I had a terrible time getting those uh, up above 75. We had uh, mar uh, marks in those days were numbers. But I did so well in Shakespeare that he had to pass me, he said. Well, this should have been a hint to somebody somewhere along the line. Something was off. I didn't really discover what was going on until sometime later when uh, I, I was making a confusion in my mind between uh, what I thought I was talking was English, but actually it wasn't. It was American. It was American dialect, a vernacular that I grew up with. And uh, the people around me had their own idiom and their own syntax, and it wasn't anything like the syntax that Miss Timmer expected of me. All the way, I managed to pass that course to amuse you. Uh, the coach, my friends, everybody was trying to help me, you know, with my essays, and I uh, still got low marks the first couple of weeks in the second semester. Then I decided that the best thing to do was uh, to sit in Miss Timmer's class. Uh, listened very carefully, not so much to the sense of what she was saying, but to the manner and the tone and the, and the style. And, uh, and then have her rhythms, because I, I apparently am also highly musically minded, and I listen to her rhythms and inflections and so on, and get that all in my head, and then take the assignment she gave for the next class, run to my room, and write the theme with her words and her sentences going through my head. Well, right away, I got B pluses. <laughs> See, even some A's. Dear Mr. Feikema, you're doing very well. This is a splendid turn. <laughs> well, I still really learned, didn't learn to write my own style. You see, I still wasn't uh, hooking who, uh, what I really had in me with, with what I could do easily. I was still going through another person. <laughs> Much later, it was much later that I uncovered what was going on, that uh, 
uh, reared as I was in the country, I had an idiom going in my head and a natural grammar and a natural syntax, which is say, like the difference, be the difference between my grammar and Miss Timmer's is the difference between Mark Twain and Henry James. See, and I think Mark Twain's going to win out. I know I'm winning out over Miss Timmer. <laughs> So by the time I was out of college, uh, I really was quite apologetic. And of course, I hadn't anything printed except in the college papers. I did meet over the years some interesting writers. I stayed for one week at St. Clair Lewis's house in um, Duluth. My second book was printed, and he called up one day. I was out in Bloomington, just moved out there. My wife was in town because the house wasn't finished, and it was too cold for her. So I'd meet her weekends in town. Uh, near the university, but during the week I'd be out there with a the dog in the winter, uh, with a stove in the corner, dog and I wrestling to see who'd get the closest to it, and uh, uh, typing up, this is the year, the third book, Boy Almighty was just published, and the phone rang one night when I was um, uh, making a steak and some fried potatoes, and uh, I thought maybe it was my brother or somebody calling me, and so I kept uh, moving, turning the steak over and stirring the potatoes around while I was listening and didn't quite get it clear. But suddenly there is this voice, uh, Mr. Freikema, this is Sinclair Lewis. I'm sure it was somebody pulling my leg, you know, absolutely. So I smarted off a little bit. <laughs> he kind of liked that. He later on told friends, this guy is real witty. <laughs> Truth was that when I did dawn on me who it was, then I didn't have anything to say. <laughs> then later on he told people, and he also knows when to shut up. So everything was working right. <laughs> so he invited me to his room in the, uh, in the Leamington Hotel, and I met him there with Ann Chittister. Here was this, you know, internationally famous figure, and, and uh, I was about as abashed as... as uh, Students are when I meet them now, you know, I know just what they're going through because I felt the same way. Here's this great man sitting there, twinkling, you know, ravaged face, um, Nobel Prize winner, and he's looking at you with a smile. And then, to make it really uh, very upsetting, he uh, um, talks to me about ten minutes and he turns to Ann Chittister, whom he knew real well. At the time, I, I, was, I was thinking to myself, he almost knows her too well. Uh, they're so friendly. Uh, he says, uh, oh, isn't he a great guy? Isn't he, yeah, that man is going to be a great man. Oh, I thought, what a, what a, you know, it sounded like your aunt trying to praise you when you didn't deserve it, you see. I was real suspicious of it. And then the next thing he said, how about coming up to my house for a week? So I said, well, if you want me there. I said, I'm just married. Oh, he says, uh, I just want you and Ann up there. I says, well, I'm just married, and I'm still really in love, and I like to take my wife. She wouldn't like it very well. So finally, he says, well, if you have to take your wife, take her along. But he really didn't like this idea. He was caught. So it turned out, though, that about four days after we're up there, he becomes more fond of my wife than he does of me. So, <laughs> But we had a great time, and I learned, you know, here was a real man in action, and uh, he did some things uh, while we were there. He liked to have long breakfasts. That week he wasn't writing. And then long evening meals, he'd sit around the table. Instead of going to the living room, he liked to sit in these deep red chairs at the, at the big dining table and talk. And one night, he had a reputation, you know, for being uh, irascible and easily hurt, uh, angry and, and fought with a lot of people. I never fought with him myself. Uh, we were just two different, we both recognized we were two different kinds of animal. He was more of the cat scratcher type, you know, satirist. I'm more of the brooding bear type. And, and uh, I don't know, dogs and cats, uh, dogs chase after, uh, after cats, it's true. But in nature, bears and, um, and uh, um, uh, mountain lions uh, tend to watch each other pretty carefully and they don't take after each other. I think this is probably the reason we didn't ever uh, tangle. But he did do an odd thing there. He, there was a judge's wife there who, uh, because she was a judge's wife, she was, you know, practically the queen of the land, and that gave her a lot of rights to make 
rather wild remarks and insulting remarks, and we're supposed to take it. But Mr. Lewis took only a few of them, and finally he uh, turned on her and uh, let her have a blast. And finally he says, you know, in fact, he says, uh, I'm not going to sit at the same table with you. And he gets up and goes upstairs. Here we are at dinner guests at his house. A wild scene. Uh, I thought to myself, well, now, when I get to be a famous man, that's something I'm not going to do ever. Of course, I haven't done it yet. But I'll tell you something. I've met some women that I've thought of doing this, though. <laughs> and I may still. And I, I got to meet later on uh, Red Warren, who was at the university here, and had many talks with him. We used to walk from the U, make the circle go over the... Uh, Franklin, uh, walk down along the river road, make the Franklin Avenue Bridge, and then come up to the bottom before you had the road in here, and come over to Washington Avenue, go back. And in the course of which we talk. He was interested in the fact that I uh, uh, was a friend of Eric Severide, and that I knew uh, uh, friends of Governor Olson, and he was going to, he was at the moment writing King of Spain, or, uh, All the King's Men. And he didn't know it too well, and he asked me if he could, uh, asked me questions about it, and I said, it's fine with me because I'll never write about politics, and you can have whatever I have. Later on, he shared something with me, and this is a characteristic of, uh, of real artists, first-rate artists, at least in his case. They share. They're, they don't, They know that even if two people were to go after the same subject and the same, and the same people in the same time, there'd be no problem. You'd still look at it differently. You wouldn't look at it the same. There is a lot of jealousy going on in the second and third uh, echelons of the art world, but in the upper reaches there, they uh, are all pretty magnanimous and generous. And Warren, he and I are also different people, but we became very good friends. Later on, I spent a week with Dos Passos, and I spent some time with Henry Miller and Max Eastman. But still, I would go around, no matter how well I knew these men, apologizing for being an artist. Well, what really changed my mind are two things. And I want to share that with you. I had a chance to go to the Huntington Hartford Foundation, now gone, unfortunately. Mr. Huntington Hartford, uh, uh, rather foolishly, he's rather foolish with his money, uh, bought an island called Hog Island in the Bahamas, changed the name to Paradise Island, I think it is. And because he wouldn't play ball with the local gamblers, he lost everything. So he had to sell the Huntington Hartford Foundation in California, Pacific Palisades, to make up the difference. Which is a terrible shame, because that was a great institution that I saw. I was there twice for three months. This is a place where they had 16 cabins, separate artist studios. And they tried to have 16 residents there. They, the, the fellowship lasted for one to six months depending on who you were. If you were young, you got one, and if you were older, you got more. They tried to have old with young in your given field. There were four fields, uh, painting, sculpting, writing, and music. And it had to be original. No critics, no essayists. You had to be an original, someone who makes something new. New painting or a new piece of sculpture. It had to be a composition not just to be a, someone that's a virtuoso, you know, and renders it, which is a great field, but it's still a second art. And no, no conductors, even though conductors get the most attention in the, in the, in the, in the arts and entertainment world, uh, they're still second raters as compared to the original composers. And the same way with the writing, you either had to be a poet or a novelist. And if you were writing plays, that too. These people came from all over the world, from England and from Java, India, Afghanistan, France, uh, everywhere. And they usually had them staggered so that you got to, I got to meet about 30 each time. Well, when I first drove in that place, uh, I still went in there with my misconception. You know, I thought, oh, this is going to be something. These are arty people. You know, we now say hippies and so on. This is going to be something. I'm going to just mind my own business and, and get my work in and get out. Uh, but I was told the rules of the place. The rules were that you could come in for breakfast to the common house, commons, or you could have your breakfast in your little cabin. Lunch was brought to you and hung on a little peg outside the door. You hardly heard him go by. 
and the evening you were expected to come in for dinner. The rule was that no one was allowed to knock on your door, even the help, unless you left an invitation. If anybody knocked on your door, and he was a resident there, and you reported, they left the same day. This was to ensure privacy. Well, all the time I was there, uh, some of the things that dawned on me was that great sense of honor. For example, Miss Chavez, who had a painter, lived, who, who was such a fine painter she could hardly talk. See, her way of communication was through, the, through her drawing. One o'clock, we usually got our mail, and I happened to go and get it about the same time she did. And uh, I had a couple letters, so I sat down to read them. She had a letter, and it was too fat. Five cents due. Before she opens the letter and reads it, she, she hustles down the ravine, it's about a quarter of a mile, gets the nickel, comes back, and gives it to the girl in the office. I couldn't get over that. Here's Huntington Hartford worth, you know, maybe a hundred million. What's the nickel to him? This could be your attitude, you see. This is often the attitude of modern kids, and not only modern kids, but every generation has had this attitude. This isn't just the modern kids, but every generation. I know many in my day, and my father talked to them about his day. There's always somebody that says, what's the nickel to a rich man? But the point was that this girl felt she owed a nickel, and she went and got it. Then she opened her letter. And there were other such things. They always were, they were, they were curious about each other. Uh, did you work today? Did it go good today? And as the days went by, uh, instead of hearing a lot of criticism and crabbing and uh, store clerks uh, you know, asking when you're going to pay your bills, instead you had this continual interest, did you do something new today? Most of these people realized that they would never be famous. There's just two or too many artists, and they probably didn't quite have the ability. They knew from the very start that, idealistic as they were, They'd always be broke, probably, like a good missionary is. He did it, he, they were in there for the cause. That's why they were there. They weren't there, and they, were, they needed some help, so they got it. They weren't in it for profit or gain. They were in it to bring something new into the world, of which they got great satisfaction making, but it actually was something bigger than self. They were aiming themselves at something bigger and larger. This is true of Max Eastman and Carl Van Dorn and Henry Miller, who I met not at the place, but in connection with it. Same attitude. Warm cheer. Uh, painters would try to find out what the writers, how they looked at life. Um, sculptors would ask the musicians, uh, how do you look at this? Or, and it, and it, it was always sort of done easily. Casually, off the cuff, and, and so then really fine remarks would come. I made some observations about the four different categories, by the way, which should be of interest to an arts festival. The most literate and the most uh, communicative, one who could speak the, could, could express his ideas the best verbally, were the writers. Then those next best were the sculptors. Then or the, the, the next, uh, those, who, no, those who could speak less um, uh, literally were the sculptors, but they were still fairly well, good. Painters had some difficulty getting across to you some complicated idea or even some little simple idea. The musicians were almost uh, dull or dumb, you know, they could hardly talk. But they were brilliant, because when you said something, you, their eyes lit up very quickly. But they often were the quickest to catch what you're up to, but they had trouble telling a thing. And I think this holds true, too. See, the only thing is, we writers were using our medium for communication. And that's why they were slow in our category. But if we were to go, when the musicians got together and talked, we could hardly catch what they were doing. They'd laugh over all kinds of little things that we didn't know what was going on. A couple of little phrases here on the piano, you know, or a little tune or a bird singing or something, they'd get something out we wouldn't get. So we all learned from each other. It was a great experience. I happened to go to Calvin College, which is very much like Augsburg College, religious school supported by a denomination. And uh, it really is set up to uh, be, uh, the college part is really set up to pick the best 
to go to the seminary and then become ministers, or the normal school side. And since I was a janitor in the dormitory, the way I earned my way through school, uh, and the dormitory was the cheapest place to live, they had the greatest number, most of the men there, 80, some 80 men, most of them were seminarians. So I got to see the insides of what goes into making a minister. And at the time, I'll have to say I took a pretty dim view of those fellows. <laughs> they were the most slovenly, usually. The guys that now have the highest paid jobs in the ministry were the guys who were the, the most slovenly in the campus. I, I often think about that when I see them. You know, I, I, they, I read the religious magazines and uh, from Calvin, and uh, here's this man who's the most famous in the whole Dutch Christian Reformed uh, uh, organization, and he was the worst guy in the dormitory, keeping his room neat. He was always late to get his dust out in front. When I came by, I had to pick it up. So I took a rather dim view of it. However, there were some that were humble and modest, became great. Now, when I was at Huntington, the second time, it came over me one day uh, that my mother's instinct and mankind's instinct to have uh, ministers of the gospel, people who try to illuminate our life, whom we have as leaders, spiritual leaders, uh, it's, it was assumed by my mother and it's assumed by the college and it's assumed by many of these denominational schools that the people who will probably be our best illuminators will be the ministers and the missionaries. But it has come over me that perhaps the greatest and the finest illuminators, the true children of God, those who are most children of God, are the artists. I'm not talking about these people that pretend they're artists, say, in San Francisco. None of those people are artists, even though they act as though they are arty. What do they do? They maybe write one poem in a whole lifetime. Jack Kerouac is, a, is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, uh, an exception. He actually was one of those, uh, what we now call hippies, uh, who did some work. But most of them don't work. Real artists work. And they work very hard, and they dream hard, and they live for something bigger than themselves. And they're, they're trying to illuminate, bring us some light. I always say that uh, the true ministers of light, uh, before they can save us, must bring light, must illuminate the world first, so we can see, and then make distinctions, and then, and then go about the business of saving ourselves. In a, in a religious and private sense, as well as an overall large, civilized culture sense. The second thing that I came into about that time was a book, which your library should own, called Born Under Saturn. You know the word Saturnine? Someone that's sourish on life, like Ambrose Bierce, and Lewis was, Sinclair Lewis was sometimes. That's the idea, born under Saturn. Supposedly, artists are born under this odd star that makes everybody a little weird and odd. And the title is a satire on people's notion of what an artist is about. It's written by Rudolf and Margot Wittkauer, who are uh, art historians. They made a study of the artists from the beginning of time of any record of artists up to the 17th century in all civilizations. It's quite a fat book. I read that thing uh, with increasing astonishment as I went along. As they very carefully would take each uh, highest, the, uh, the lowest and the highest pitch of each civilization, and then the ages, different ages, and they would, and the different styles that came through, and they would compare, say, 10 artists with, say, 10 bankers, or 10 artists with 10 politicians, or 10 artists with um, generals, and make comp comparison as to how uh, their, 
what their, what their behavior was like in, in, in society, not just their contributions, but their behavior also. And if there was for a while a little style where uh, grown men got too interested in little boys, as they did in the Greek civilization, and they did later on in the Roman civilization, uh, it wasn't just the artists who did this. It was just as prevalent among the bankers and uh, among the politicians and among the, um, and the, uh, the priests, or uh, what we say ministers. If it went the other way, uh, where there was relatively little of this, and all of them were men were men and women and women, and there was a big distinction between them, then this was true also of the artists. And they finally wound up at the end of the book. They didn't go into modern times because they felt that they, it was too close for them to be objective. Their conclusion were, artists, creators, are no different from anyone else in society. No, they're no different from any other category, any other profession. They tend to have the same behavior patterns in general. But there's, there is this one little thing that distinguishes them. They're just like everybody else, but they have a little more of it just like everybody else, but they have a little more of it. And what you're really saying there, you see, is they kept alive that sense of wonder as a child. They didn't die in them. So they, that's why they seem to have a little more. Their light's a little lighter, a little brighter than the ones around them. But otherwise, they're the same, no different. So I no longer have misgivings about saying, Yes, I try to be a creator. It's the finest thing I can think of. And were my mother alive today, I would spend some time with her convincing her that I did take up the ministry. But not what she expected it to be. It's a little different. I'd like to say a few words also about... <coughs> The neglect that has taken place in American letters, and for that matter, world letters, something that's being overlooked because they're busy looking in another direction now, the English departments in the country, that is those that are east of the Mississippi River, generally speaking, and you can't blame them. Men who spend six, seven, eight, nine years after they get their bachelor's degree and then have to teach part-time and first get their master's and then doctorate, they have such a heavy time as well as emotional investment in being an expert on Dickens or Shakespeare or Milton or any of the old men in the English literature that <clears throat> so that when they look out they look through Dryden's eyes in England at America and so they really don't see America they look through say a series of three three different kinds of glasses. And you, you know, if you're driving down the road and you have an ordinary set of glasses and you stick a pair of dark glasses over that and then still another and still another, you're gonna have trouble seeing the directions where you're at. You probably even won't know where you're at. You might, you might, instead of being on the freeway here, you may be in the Autobahn and in Germany, you wouldn't know the difference. So you really can't blame those fellows for doing that. It'll take time either to change their mind or for them to die off and a new generation to come in. And to understand that our early American writers uh, really are echoes of European writers, they're imitators of Europe. Uh, Melville is the, is the only one, and, and Whitman are the only two really that stick out in the 19th century as American, truly American. And Whitman is the one who really sounds most American because Melville still writes somewhat in the flamboyant or explosive Shakespeare, Shakespeare style. But since then, we've had Faulkner. Uh, one of the reasons why they scorned Mark Twain was precisely for that reason. He didn't sound English. He sounded, sounded like he was, you know, humorist, uh, buffoon, and so on. Now, all our masters like Hemingway and Faulkner say that uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Twain is their father. And it's interesting. He lived right on the line between the North and the South. So Faulkner looks to him as his father, and Hemingway, who comes from Chicago, Oak Park, Illinois, uh, regards Twain as his literary father. He's my grandfather, so to speak. 
But they have been either aiming themselves at Europe and being thinking, you know, that you, uh, the way to bring culture to the Americans and the way to, to make people conscious of culture is to right away point out what they have in Europe. The only trouble with that is that the people in Europe um, also have to be reminded about what their culture is. They don't have culture naturally. They have to be reminded, too, in England, for example, that they have an English culture. And as a matter of fact, they tend to look to other countries for models rather than England. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's something you can't help. This is the way you grow up as a country. You do look to models around. And the truth is that all along, we have some very remarkable geniuses in our own right in the literary world. And I might say, in the musical world. Isn't it a terrible shame that Charles Ives probably only heard 95% of his musical co compositions played in his own lifetime? And he's one of the great musical creators in all time. He's so great that he could compose on a sheet of paper and know it would be good without having to hear it. He didn't even have to hear a, a rehearsal to, cor to correct his compositions. Heard all in his head. We have some very great men in the sculpture that aren't getting their just dues because uh, washed up Europe since uh, it's expressionistic and impressionistic and Dadaist styles over here and right away some of our unthinking artists adopt this you know wholeheartedly and so we have all this sort of silly abstract art which is no more really than decorative art uh, it's just the beginning you're learning to most uh, abstract painters are people who are still beginning to uh, use uh, the, uh, the methods of art you have to make a step beyond it and start having some meanings beyond just abstract we have some fine sculptors here. Lonnie Hauser has never had his just due. That's because he, he, he keeps sculpting um, uh, real women in stone and men. And he isn't doing, as, as he calls it, junkyard art, scrapyard art. We have many great men who, in about 20, 30, 50 years, will be seen as giants. But the scholars and the teachers are still too busy pointing at models from away from us, when we have our own great ones. The East, except for New England, great New York and great Philadelphia and great Chicago, everything east of the Wabash River, which is really one whole city, a great sea of mud, has never produced really a first-rate genius of any kind. The geniuses that they admire in American literature are men that come from the hinterlands. Hemingway dead, Steinbeck dead, Dreiser dead. Name one. There isn't one from New York. There isn't one from Philadelphia. There isn't one from Chicago. That is a native Chicagoan. There are always people that came in from the hinterlands. And the curious thing is that when you read a review, I remember when my first reviews came out, they thought that I was satirizing Life in Iowa and in southern Minnesota. And isn't that wonderful? See, that's why we're not living there. The man's right. It's a terrible place. When it dawned on him about the third and fourth book that I really wasn't satirizing or pointing fingers at it, I was just merely telling the truth about it, and I loved it, then I was no good. Then those poor fellows over there, they thought that there was something wrong with me, and I probably wasn't very good in the first place. This is true of all the fellows that come in. You have to learn their rules, and if you're going to live in New York and Philadelphia and Washington, this is what you've got to do to survive. They forget that the greatest constellation of human minds to appear on Earth at the same time occurred in Greece, in Athens, with a civilization of not much more than 125,000 people. This included the slaves. Aeschylus, Sophocles, Euripides, Aristophanes, Socrates, Plato, Pericles, the, the, the great politician and orator, occurred within a short span in one country, less than 125,000 people. So don't take great numbers. And we're more apt to have, and the reason we are getting our good men out of the hinterlands is because they come from areas where there is some room. And if you take a good look at Athens, 
by way of Mr. Kittle, who writes well about it, you'll see that they had a lot of walking room. The peripatetic school, what does that mean? They took walks out in the country under the trees, under the olive trees and so on, and discussed philosophy. Faulkner didn't finish high school. I'm not saying that he was an ignoramus and was an unconscious artist. He was a highly cultured man, but he followed his own nose. He read on his own. Steinbeck, just a high school graduate. Hemingway, a high school graduate. Dreiser, high school graduate. That's because they could move untrammeled with some area around them, follow their own nose, and thank God could say no to instruction which pointed them east. It allowed them to look at their own terrain and to reflect it through their, their materials. Now the most recent of these men finally got their just dues after much struggle. But there's another crew of men that haven't got their just dues yet. One of them is Vardis Fisher, 72 years old, author of over 30 books, some of them masterpieces. Dark Bidwell, in the paperback is called The Wild Ones, or Tale of Valor, or The Mothers. Great as anything that Hemingway has done, or Faulkner, or any of the men, he hasn't got his just dues. You know why? He never goes to cocktail parties in New York. He never spends any time there. He lives in Hagerman, Idaho. He cultivates trees and takes walks over the lava beds over there and looks around in his own soul and, and looks at the skies and tries to find in life what the meanings are. He spends some time brooding to himself. One of the, he happens to have a, a doctor's degree from University of Chicago, but he's turned his back on it all. When he wants to know something, he writes to the Library of Congress and gets his books if he needs it. Talking to this man, I talked to Red Lewis and I talked to Warren, who has also got his doctorate, and I know Tate and so on, these men. I have the impression that when you talk to Vardis Fisher, you're talking to not only one of the great geniuses of our time, but one of the best minds, scholarly minds of our time, but on his own terms, and not according to, say, some regimen that the, that the universities uh, were over-influenced, uh, alien to America. This is not to say that you should turn your back on the English literature or the English language. I always say uh, to young kids that come to me, boys uh, having some emotional problem with a girl, don't know whether they should marry her or not. Well, if you're not sure about the girl, take a look at the girl's mother. Or if you're not sure of that, look at her, her grandmothers, both of them. Then you'll get an idea of what she's going to be like. It's the same way with the language. If you're going to be a good user of the American language or the American English language, Take a key. You better know the English language itself, the mother. And before that, you better know the grammar of the English, of our language. And that's old Anglo-Saxon. It happens, just in my case, because I'm a Frisian, I can read Chaucer naturally. So I speak as someone who's right in the middle of the stream. And not just here in the American end of it, but all the way from Piers the Plowman and Beowulf, all, I can read those. Almost naturally, certainly Chaucer, I stand right in the middle of that whole stream and I speak from that vantage point. I'm not just an idle attacker of English departments. I'm just trying to straighten them out a little bit that they're not looking at it right. That when they get a student in class who happens to come out of a lively family, has a lively uh, uh, tongue, and he's vivid, and he happened to grow up in an area where there was a lot of wit, American wit going on, natural American vernacular wit, that it's the, the, the composition teacher in the freshman year should, of course, point out, this is the way we write English sentences, but you have a wonderful language there. You're, you have something like Mark Twain. Now, to make it work, you ought to know just how you're using that American vernacular. Pick out what you should keep. Because this is new. Right? It's hardly ever done. A few teachers here and there do it, but it is very well done. And it's out of these people, as far as literature goes, that you're going to get your writers. 
Fisher does write some things that I don't get and I shy away from, and I understand why profs back off from him. Uh, this long 13-volume Testament of Man series, oh, there's some funny things in there. But better take your time about something you're going to point your finger at before you really do it. I recall how for years I resisted Faulkner. I didn't want to read him. I heard all these stories about him. Uh, he wrote about swamps and uh, animal-obsessed people and so on. And uh, my, But my friends Red Warren and uh, Russell Roth and others would write, a, would talk about him incessantly. We have a little party and everybody, they'd talk about Fork and they'd talk about Spotted Horse and they'd laugh and laugh and laugh and they had a great time. And I thought, well, I better get in on the swim. I better dig into him. And Red Warren and Russell Roth both told me, well, the thing to do is to read the port uh, Portable Faulkner, edited by Malcolm Colley. So I read that. Halfway through, I thought, oh, I'm catching it. This man is a great organ player. Plays a masterful organ with his feet and his nose and everything. And, of course, I've never heard any pieces played with the nose or my feet, but it might be good in the feet world or the nose world. Who knows? There's still half of Faulkner I don't get. I think it's due to the fact that it's whiskey inspired. But who knows, it might be some revelation that I don't get. So I'm now very c careful about how I say I, the other half of Faulkner I don't get, I won't make any comment on it. Same way with Conrad, I resisted him. I read him a little bit, I think, ooh, why did he get out of this fellow? Dull. Well, it happened that my mother-in-law one day called home excitedly. She was at a sale down at uh, uh, some fellow in 12th and Nicollet where they, they buy out furniture from some old Minnetonka house or up in Mount Curve or uh, Summit Avenue, and they have these um, sets of books that are never cut, you know, uh, uncut sets, leather-bound. And she called excited, and she says, uh, there's a set here of Thackeray for $5 leather-bound and a set of Smollett for $5 and a set of Dickens and a whole string and also Conrad. Well, I said, you can get them all, but I don't know whether you should get Conrad or not. But it was, she decided she wanted anyway because it's such a beautiful set. So she got Conrad. Well, I was given it. And my friends Russ Roth and Dan Brennan and Ed Warren, they wanted that set because they discovered that set was worth over $100, and they also liked it. So before I gave it to them, I thought, well, I want to at least get $5 out of it. So I read All Mayor's Folly, and I started down the line. And lo and behold, about a third of the way in, I gave him a chance. See, I read about 1,500 pages. I gave Conrad a chance. He at least, you know, he was an excellent writer. Other men said so, so I better give him a chance. 1,500 pages in, I was taken over. And then it dawned on me why I resisted him. Here he is. He's a Pole, raised as a boy as a Pole, so his basic structure is Polish, of the aristocracy. He learned, so he learned to speak and to feel as a Pole. Then he became a Frenchman and as a, as a sailor and as a, and as a contraband runner, and he fell in love in French. Then later on he became an English sailor, and he learned to speak and think and or write in French. So every time he wrote a sentence, he wrote it through three veils. A language shouldn't really be a veil between you and your friend. It shouldn't be a a window that opens, not even a window. It shouldn't even be a pane of glass. It should be absolutely clear back and forth. But all too unfortunately, because we're so concerned with style and precision and neatness, and uh, that language becomes a pain. P-A-N-E, and sometimes P-A-I-N, too. And I agree that it should be good, you know. But here is a, he, he, he came at me through three pains, and so it was, the image that he was giving me was somewhat diffused, and so I wasn't catching Conrad. But when I caught up on this, then, oh, yeah, everything came, fell into place. And by the time he was an old man, he learned to write the English language very well, but he didn't have much to say anymore. But the last books, Arrow of Gold, were written as if he was born in the English tongue. So in the case of Fisher, you should, these English teachers should take their time before they condemn it. Pick up what you like and then move from there. Another great writer that's been overlooked, Frank Waters. Written a trilogy about the Rocky Mountains, about gold mining, silver mining, rather. He's written two marvelous books about the Southwest Indians. 
people of the valley, and the man who killed the deer. A superior artist ranks well with Hemingway. You probably, none of you have read him. Another one, Walter Van Tilburg Clark. You know a little bit more about him. Four books. And unfortunately, he spent too much time being a teacher, which is an all compelling occupation, just like it is to be a librarian. If you're a good teacher, you have no time to write. It's impossible to write unless you're writing about teaching. Because it's a, it's a time, if you're a good teacher, you think about your students when you leave the classroom. You think about them when you go to bed. There's some problem there. You think about them when you wake up in the middle of the night. That child or that boy has got something and it isn't coming through and I gotta wake it up. This is the way an artist works. He works night and day. Clark taught too long and so he only gave us four books and he's done now. There's a little more there. That's somewhat bitter, and I won't mention it on my part anyway. I think that some of his colleagues tore him to pieces when he tried to teach like an English professor without a doctorate or a master's, you see. And you can't, see, it's a full-time job to be a teacher, and you just can't do the two together. Something's going to get killed in you, and, they, and by association, he killed the artist in him. It's gone. These men have not got their just due. But they're going to get it. The University of South Dakota is now publishing a little uh, review, and they're beginning to talk about this. There's now a new magazine started in uh, Colorado State called Western American Literature. They, there are, west of the Mississippi, there are 100 universities and colleges with a course now called Western American Literature. That's not cowboys or anything like that. This is a serious course studying such people as Willa Cather, who really leads it off, and Fisher, and Waters, and Clark, and possibly A.B. Guthrie. Some doubt about him. He's a little too popular and a little too accepted by the East, you see. It's, they can, if any time the East can accept as easy, be suspicious. There's something wrong there. And you can't blame these people for writing as they do if they're real artists. Anyone who is a real artist can't help but be a reflector, a voice for his area. And a good artist seeks to be a voice. In my case, a voice for all my relatives that I know and the little life that I've had. I really am not important. The books count and the truth counts. And then a reflector of the pioneers before them, and before them the trappers, and before them the Indians, and before them the Hopewells and the Adena people who lived along these rivers for some eight, nine thousand years and had somewhat of a civilization which is lost now and disappeared. And before that, the dinosaurs or the little animals. Well, before that, the little animals. In my own case, my concept of what it means to be an artist is that I not only try to, well, not don't set out consciously, but when these things want to talk through me, I let them go on the page. And I don't care what an editor or a friend or anyone's going to say, including my wife. I let the pioneer talk through me, as well as my current and contemporaries. Let the trappers, let the Indians talk through me. Let the dinosaurs talk through me, because they lived here too. And they probably set up all the trails we follow today, those original animals. And before that, the little creatures, the little three-toed animal that's uh, left here to go to Asia and then come back now, comes back now as a horse by way of Spain. Be a voice for the algae and water, the original growth, the original uh, life on, uh, on this uh, surface here. Be a voice for the salt ocean of which we all carry four or five quarts in us, salty blood. That's the ocean in us still. Be a voice for the inert molecules on which the sun beat and beat and beat and beat for some four, five, six billion years till something jumped. And finally, be a voice for the sun. This is what it means to be an artist, and it's the finest thing you can be. Thank you.